Got all your Christmas shopping done, Carol? Uh, for the most part, but I'm still open to buying a last minute gift or two. For me? Uh, sure, but I was actually thinking of for me. <laughs> of course you were. <laughs> and I'll tell you about one of the gifts I bought myself when we get down to the rabbit holes. Let's get cool. started. Welcome to the Garden Angelus, where we talk about flowers, veggies, and all the best dirt. I'm Carol Michael from Indianapolis, Indiana, where I have a suburban garden measured in square feet. It's about a third of an acre. And I'm Dean Ash from Guthrie, Oklahoma, where I actually garden an acre and a half out of seven and a half acres out in the boondocks. We call ourselves Garden Angelus because we are evangelists for gardening. We love gardening and we want others to love it too. Yes, we do. And we aren't afraid to spill the beans and tell all of our gardening secrets, the good, the bad, and often the ugly. <laughs> but that's enough of who, what, when, where. Let's move on to this week's episode. How does your garden grow in the middle of winter? It grows good. But I was just thinking about our intro. Should we talk about how we're we're not afraid to get to the root of the problem? <laughs> or how, you know, budding topics, branching out. <laughs> <laughs> always vining reaching for the sky yeah okay how many more puns can we come up with uh, well i think we rose to the occasion <laughs> oh good good to hear it all right so moving on what happened in your sunroom there was a calamity i see well yeah so i went in the sunroom the other day and you know plants need a little less water in the winter time so i hadn't really gone in there in a few days and i realized that the african blue basils were completely uh -oh. wilted almost uh -oh. half dead and so i'm thinking ooh that's bad so i watered <laughs> them and two i think are going to come out of it and so yeah. i'm going to clean those pots up and i'm going to move them over to the kitchen area by the microgreens i will pay more attention to them put them in some new potting soil and in other news, I did get a lovely amaryllis, amaryllis bulb from our friend Katie, who does our website from the Gardener Words. Yes, me too. And I was so excited. So I, I've got that all potted up. And me I too. do want to give a warning. If you go in Costco, and yep. it may happen in other stores as well, potted up amaryllis that are growing and are budded, so they'll probably bloom by Christmas. Yeah. They are flinging themselves into people's carts. Did some fling their themselves into your cart? A beautiful, yes. And it has like five amaryllis buds coming up out of those bulbs. Oh, and it's golly. like, and I, you know, once it flings itself into your cart, you do need to buy it. Heck yeah. Especially if it has five buds on it. I would do. Yeah. Think yeah. of all that work I did earlier in the season where I ordered all those bulbs and We'll take a picture of what mine look like right now and put it in the newsletter. And they are not, I mean, they've got one that might be blooming or starting to. Take agree. a picture so. of mine and we'll put that and we'll do a little comparison. We'll just How's do that? a little amaryll, have a little amaryllis moment on the newsletter. So you want to hear about my garden? I guess you yes. kind of just did. You just did. That's basically it. Now I will say the paper whites have just started to butt out and you know what? They don't stink. And I'm really That's glad. Good. Because That's I good. chose non-stinky ones. And once again, we will link to my post on non-stinky paper whites. Because you don't, friends don't let friends buy Ziva. That's another post. Because I hate Ziva. And I I mean, and I, this is the part where all the Southern gardeners come in and write us stuff and say, but I love Ziva outside. And I'm like, yeah, if I could grow Ziva outside, if it would overwinter here, I would probably love it too. I do not love it in my house. So I love all the other ones. Inball, Galilee, there's a lot. That's all. That's all that's going on. What's your favorite this week? Oh, my favorite. Let me think. I'm going to say that I really, really got a thrill out of the amaryllis that Katie sent us. Katie Elzer Peters. Yes. The Garden of Words. She, I got this notice that I was getting a package from Bluestone and I had a moment of fear. Because I thought, oh no, what did I order and forgot? <laughs> More bulbs that I haven't planted yet? God help me. And then I saw the box and I was like, oh, I bet that's from Katie. So that's my favorite this week. That is nice. Yeah. I, mine's all potted up. And so the amaryllis that threw themselves in the cart at Costco, they had uh -huh. moss packed around the bulbs real pretty. What? Exactly. <laughs> I stole some of the moss and after I potted up Katie's, 
I put some moss around it and I've set it in my bathroom where I can see it every day and watch it grow. And uh, it looks real pretty. I guess I'll go put some moss on mine too. Maybe I'll run to Costco today. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> Who knows? What's your favorite? Mine is I have snowdrops that are blooming. Yes. I'm and, jealous. And uh, yeah, just a few came up and bloomed. That's not all of them. Most of them will bloom in the spring. So I had a picture of one. I was going to put it on Instagram on a story and they have a new magic thing where that. you can make AI you went, images. <laughs> you went a little crazy with that. <laughs> I did. I was waiting. I was getting my hair done and I was sitting there and waiting and I was just like, oh, why don't I put snowdrop in a library? <laughs> snowdrop on a beach with a shark in a pot. And so then it ca- comes up with the image. It I- does. I saw them on your stories. They're still up, but they won't be by the time this airs. But that's You know okay. what? I had such fun. I actually might write a blog post about it because it was kind of hilariously fun. You could also take all those images and turn them into a reel. And that would be funny too. You know what? I'm going to do that instead. That's what I'm going to do. That'd be fast. Okay. I thought of one more thing I really love. What's one that? More. My Helleborus Niger is blooming oh, out front. Yes. I sent you a picture. It looks really good this year. Yeah, it's a good year for them. Yay! Because it didn't get too cold. So they're like, oh, we think we're in the Bahamas. I said, yes, yes, you are. Little Not exactly Niger. the Bahamas, but. Okay, well, it is only 46 degrees, but all right, fine. I like to think I'm in the Bahamas. How about you do that first quote? Okay, here's the first quote. Hang on a second. Would you like me to do the first quote? No, I'm doing the first quote. Okay. The word Advent means expectation. What Advent can do for us is create a sense of hope. Louis Giglio. And we don't know who Louis Giglio is. We just like this wonderful quote. Exactly. The reason we had to pause for a second was because Carol had to put do not disturb on her watch. And then right after Carol did it, so did Dee. Our flower this week is flowers, plural, are Christmas plants other than poinsettias, which was my last article for Oklahoma Living Magazine. I wrote for them for a very long time, and I finally decided that I I had done all the articles I could do for that, you know what I mean, in that particular parameter. And I loved working for them, though. So we thought we would feature this and link to that article. So Christmas plants other than poinsettias, there are so many, and we've talked about some of them already. Yeah. So let me ask you, do you have a poinsettia in your house? I do not yet. I I haven't decided if I'm going to do one this year because here's the thing. I love poinsettias. I think they are so beautiful, but you have to buy them on a day when it's not too cold so that they don't get shocked in your car as you're doing your Christmas shopping. That's number one. Number two, they last in my house about a week and then, or two, because I'm not a very good poinsettia mama. And number three, I don't know. I just am not in the mood this year. I'm more in the bulb mood, I think. Yeah. I understand you, that. When I, when I was at Lowe's, and I'll, well, I was at Lowe's, and I'll tell you why I was at Lowe's. They had some little, I, I think they were probably in four inch pots, two mm-hmm. for five bucks poinsettias. They looked pretty bad. And I thought, hmm. Maybe I, no, and I didn't, Yeah, but I, I saw another one at another place. It was so beautiful. And I was like, hmm, maybe. So I suspect between now and Christmas, one or two poinsettia will enter the house. And it ties back to one of my lost ladies of garden writing, the one from last week, Daisy Thompson Abbott. Yeah, She wrote an article about how to get your Christmas plant to last for years, years. No, thank you. No, thank you. Peace. <laughs> Well, she had an idea. It was different. I'd never heard this. But she said once the poinsettia had dropped its bracts, the color black bracts, she cuts it down to ground level and lets it come back up from basically. And then she puts it in the closet to get it dark so it'll bloom later, right? Well, she didn't even say that. She just said, you know, that just do it. Okay. Well, it has to have some darkness or it won't turn red or whatever right. color. I think. Yeah. Um, but she's just telling you to grow up for years. Here's the thing. I, uh, no, I'm not doing that. But I get, I mean, lots of people ask that question. I think some people think that because they get a plant 
that they are ob- ob- obligated to keep it forever. And my attitude is, no, they're just like anything else. When you're done with them, you can compost them unless they're a problem. And then you throw them in the trash. So on your list, and let's just go, it's amaryllis, paper whites, Christmas cactus, and Thanksgiving cactus, hyacinths, Norfolk Island pine, fluorocyclamen. There are only two of those that I would say, yeah, that's a house plant that's going to last a while. The Norfolk Island pine is one of them, if yes. you do it right. Yes. And what's your other one? The Christmas the cactus. Or the, the Christmas, Christmas cactus, cactus, of course. Yeah. No. So here's the deal. The Norfolk, I I put it on there because my mom got a Norfolk Island pine and my mom had that pine for mm, 15 years. And my mom was not a gardener and she, but she had the perfect window for it with the perfect sunlight and the perfect conditions. And that thing thrived. And one year we did use it as a Christmas tree. And then she kept it for years and years. And actually when she, I want to say when she moved out of her home to go be in independent living because she couldn't take care of right. herself all by herself, I think she gave it to her best friend who probably promptly killed it. But, you know, I couldn't take it. And that, and that, because I don't have the right sunlight for it. And, and I also like to break up with plants. I am one of those people. Yeah. You're so fickle. <laughs> I am fickle. I like, so here- I like different plants. So here's a Christmas cactus story. So okay. someone I know from back in my high school days is a greeter at the Meyer store. And she stopped me and she said, you would know. And I'm like, no, what? She says, <laughs> why my Christmas cactus isn't blooming? And I'm yeah, like, I know. she says, it's 200 years old. I said, first of all, 200? I said, first of all, your Christmas cactus is not 200 years old. She says, "Uh uh-huh. I got it from a lady who said it was 200 years old. I said, this, no Christmas, no Christmas cactus is dating back to the early 1800s. There's no way. No, because when did they start bringing them over to the United States? I don't know. I don't know. But I wouldn't be surprised if there was one that somebody had from like the 30s or the 40s, 1930s, 1940s. Right. So. I, I told her she probably was not, she was probably giving it too much love and attention. And I said, watch the first five minutes of the original Walton's movie to see how Mrs. Walton took care of her Christmas cactus. Basically, she put it in a window well in their cellar and ignored it until she goes down there a few days before Christmas and it's blooming. That you just ignore it and it'll it's, do its you thing. ignore it and you take away some of its light. And the truth is, is you don't even have to take away very much. You don't even have to put it all down in your cellar. Just make sure it gets less light because that's why it blooms. There's a lot of these plants that are like that. And I, all three of my th- they're really Thanksgiving cactus. I don't have a Christmas cactus. We've been over that before. All of mine are blooming right now and they make me really happy. Yeah, they are a happy flower. Mine are finishing up blooming. But let's talk about the, so the other thing we can do to seg- segment this list is bulbs. There's amaryllis, paper whites, and hyacinths. And I right. think of hyacinths as the after Christmas bulb. Well, partly because you have to give them 12 weeks of chilling in order to get them to bloom. Unlike amaryllis and paper whites, which you can just stick in the ground and they bloom. So within about six weeks. And then you also were going to add two more plants. Yeah. So. Anyway, so the the bulb ones, I feel like once the bulb is done, with the exception of maybe amaryllis, it's out the door you go. Yeah. I mean, I've oversummered amaryllis and I've had, I'll be honest, intermittent success with reblooming them. And sometimes the bulbs just get all papery and anyway, they're just a pain. So they're not that expensive anymore unless you buy the really, really expensive bulbs, the great big ones. I just say toss them. In the compost or something. Now, the All other right. two, there's two on the list, the cyclamen that you listed. And mm-hmm. then I added rosemary topiaries, which always show up this time of year. That's the one you think, oh, I'm going to keep that inside in the winter. I'm going to put it outside in the summer and bring it back in. And so I'll just say the floor cyclamen is, we've talked about this before and people have suggested, just throw it under a shrub and then bring it back in. And it's like, eh, you know, forget about it. Maybe. And I was actually thinking that I had done that. And I'm thinking, I wonder where Where that cyclamen is that I put under a shrub. (laughs) Well, it's dead now because it's probably not hardy. But I did do that. I'm thinking in a pot. (laughs) No, I'm thinking, where is it? And then rosemary topiaries. Somebody told me that 
rosemary topiaries and all that that comes out, they're so poorly rooted right now that it's really hard to get them to live inside. So forget, forget about it. Yeah, forget about it. And the ones that are shaped like Christmas trees, I do buy them sometimes because they're just pretty. And they, they don't. They jump well. in your cart. You think, oh, yeah, they do. This will be do. the one. This will be the one. And then, of right course, now, I don't our, have anything on my table, so I should get something for it. You should. Yeah. So that brings us to the Christmas rose, the Helleborus Niger, which we've talked about ad infinitum. And I'm going to talk about it again at the end of this episode. So let's move on. Okay. I have a quote. Deep roots are not reached by the frost. And that's by J.R.R. Tolkien. Yes. Is it Tolkien or Tolkien? Tolkien? I say Tolkien. I do too. Someone will correct us if we said it wrong. All right. Vegetables. So in the spirit of Christmas, I am in charge of bringing the vegetables for raw veggies and dip, which we always have, because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. it sort of offsets all the, the sugar candy and stuff. I, I feel kind of healthy. This. I love this topic that you came up with. So I'm going to do a really nice platter and I'm looking at things, that pe- how people arrange it. And I was thinking, I'm just going to do greens, reds, and whites. Okay. So for, for greens, I'm going to have cucumbers broccoli, and celery. Is there any other green vegetables I should add? Yes, there's a green cauliflower now. It's, I mean, cauliflower would be green anyway if you didn't cover it up its leaves, but there's a special variety of cauliflower that is green and kind of pointy. I think it might be Romanesque, but anyway. I'll have to really look pretty. for that. I'll have to look it's for not that. hard to find. All right, so reds, are you going to do reds? Oh, I'm I need to do more greens. Let me think. I'm thinking. I mean, my mom always did the celery and she always did the stuffed celery with the cheese whiz on top of it. We're not doing, we don't necessarily do the stuffed celery, but I'll do celery. I don't think you need that. Yeah. And you know what? I always end up bringing home a lot of celery. It sounds like it's a good idea and then nobody eats it. How about olives? You could put olives. Someone else is in charge of olives and pickles. Okay. Good deal. All right. Reds. So the only two reds I came up with were, oh, I have a third red. Red cherry tomatoes and red radishes. And what's your third red? I think that I should get some red pepper to make like red pepper strips. Yeah, I think that'd be really pretty. Yes. And I could get green pepper strips too. But nobody's going to eat those because it's, you know, it's not a developed pepper. Yeah, they're not. not They're going to eat the red. they, They give people indigestions. Nobody wants that. Well, yeah, nobody wants that. I mean, it's green, but no. No, I'm going to do the red peppers. I don't know what else is red. Uh, I can't think of anything right off the top of my head. What good are you to help me, Dee? I'm out here shopping all by myself. I think you could walk down the aisle of the grocery store and see what else is red. (laughs) I was going to get some fancy red and green lettuces to put as the base. Oh, that'll be really pretty. The gem, the little gem lettuces that are red and green. That'd be lovely. Yes. The butter and lettuces. And then for the whites, I had cauliflower. Hearts of palm. I don't think we're a hearts of palm eating kind of family. Mushrooms. I don't like mushrooms. <laughs> but you don't have to eat them. Somebody else might like them. No, I've never put raw mushrooms on my platter. Never. Okay. Well, this is why I don't help you. And then you have here carrots. They're not, yeah. What do you, I mean, here's the thing. You can use the carrots as dividers, you know, do them in strips and they can be dividers even though they're not red, white, and green. Because everyone Uh, likes carrots, Carol. Okay. All right. Ranch dip. Ranch dip could be white. Yeah. I got the dip. Yeah. Of course I'm going to do a dip. I already have one of those dips. It was a special request dip, but I already have that. So we're changing our entire Christmas meal this year. I the bet you are, D. Lots of raw veggies and dip. <laughs> Probably. I ordered a smoked turkey from Texas. It's Greenberg's. So I ordered that just so I would be sure we had it. And my sweet son-in-law, Robert, called me a few days ago and he was like, Madre, we cannot cook hot dogs around you. Because <laughs> he went and researched alpha gal syndrome and he goes, we could kill you. I said, okay, calm down, Robert. But we decided not because fumes are a huge problem. And so we are not going to have the hot dogs this year. And I told them that they could still have tamales. I just wasn't going to make them. Okay, so back up. So hot dogs is one of your traditional Christmas foods? 
I know it's really weird. We did Schwab's hot dogs and kraut and we do always do shrimp, which we can still have. And then we always do tamales and they all go, okay, chicken tamales for everyone, chicken, green chili. And I said, what are tamales made with kids? And they go, we don't know. And I said, lard, that would be pork. So no, I will not be having any tamales. And no, I don't want a vegan tamale. So thank you anyway. Thank you anyway. Well, anyway, I'm in charge of veggies and dip and I I would take pictures because I know everybody wants to see how pretty I make it. I do want to see how pretty it is. All right, do the next quote. And let's go on to our book. I'm afraid that the next quote is yours because I just did the last quote. I'm afraid that it is too. Well, here comes Christmas, that astonishing thing that no commercialism can define unless we let it. J.R.R. Tolkien. Tolkien. Okay, so we're in love with this book. Are you in love with it? I know I, I am. am. I'm in love with this book. It's Letters from Father Christmas by J.R.R. Tolkien, edited by Bailey I think Tolkien. her name is Bailey or his. Bailey Tolkien. Is, it, is Bailey a, a girl or a, a man or a woman? I don't know. I don't either. Okay, I'm holding well, anyway. up the book. You put the book on your Instagram story. You tagged me. I did. I did. And I tagged you. And I actually put it on my story or the garden angelist story. And it is adorable. But the thing that we need to get across is this is one you want to order from bookshop.org. I mean, we do have an Amazon link, but we'll also put a bookshop.org link because if you want the one that is really beautiful for Christmas presents, that's the one you want. Exactly. And so I sent you something this morning on Instagram. I, I shared a story with you. And it was a woman who lives in Iceland. And I noticed that Father Christmas, we should explain, Tolkien wrote his children a Father Christmas letter every year. And you can see in the progression of the book that they had more children. You know, it started out, they just had, wasn't it just John? Just John. And then then they had Chris and then they had Michael. And I've gotten to the part where they have a little girl. And Priscilla, she wasn't named in the letter I was reading. It was the little girl. And so Father Christmas writes these hilarious letters to these kids. And they have written letters to him too. But it's so funny because Father Christmas complains all the time about how John has quit writing letters. But Chris and Michael still write letters. Yeah. And it is it is so charming. It has drawings. And, and there's a picture of the actual letter facing the printed letter so you can read it. And the Father Christmas has a lot of trouble with his polar bear. Yes, it says (laughs) there's a North polar bear. Later on, there appear snow elves, red gnomes, snowmen, K-bears, and the polar bear's nephews, Paxu and Volkatuka, who came for a visit and never went away. (laughs) But the polar bear was Father Christmas. Yeah, polar polar bear was Father Christmas's main assistant, and sometimes he writes with his paw. So it it is so charming and fun. It would be a great gift, I think, for almost anyone who's older to read. You know, older child would love it. As I mean, if they aren't English, you'll have to explain it's Santa Claus. But the thing I sent you on Instagram today was a lady who lives in Iceland, and I noticed that Father Christmas always skipped Iceland, and now I know why. <laughs> did, did Why? You this morning? Because in Iceland, they don't believe in Father Christmas or Santa Claus. And they have these horrible, horrible people that are their Christmas people. And no, it's so funny because they have, they're like, they're bad elves. And there's a Chris, then their mother, and she's a hag. And, and, and they have these really scary stories at Christmas. So yeah. Father Christmas just skips them every year. And I noticed about 1930, he started going to the North, to North America. And I was very appreciative of that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> oh my gosh. It's fun, right? It is fun. And that's letter, Letters from Father Christmas by J.R.R. R. Tolkien, edited by Bally Tolkien. And like we said, use the bookshop.org link because we think that's a better version of the book. Mm -hmm. And it also helps your local bookstores. That's right. Do that next quote for sure. It is the beautiful task of Advent to awaken in all of us memories of goodness and thus open doors of hope. Pope Benedict XVI. Our dirt. Is mistletoe a friend or foe? I say foe. It kills the trees eventually, doesn't it? 
Yes, it's it's a parasitic plant. Mm -hmm. And so I wrote a whole Family Handyman article on it last year because the question they wanted to ask is, should you grow mistletoe from seed? And the answer was, (laughs) knock yourselves out. The answer is, oh, anyway, mistletoe is spread by birds. They pick up the seed and they deposit it like in the crook of the stem and the seed is kind of sticky and it sticks. And then it it grows as a parasite in the tree and suck nutrients from the tree. Mm-hmm. And it's usually high up in the tree. And, and so by the time you notice mistletoe in a tree, it's big enough that if it was a smaller tree, it could outright kill it. But not likely to kill a big tree. No. I see it here all the time in big old elm trees out in the country. And I have some in my elm trees. It's way out. Way up high, way, way up high. Like, and it used to be that people, even when I was a kid, kids and their parents would go out into the woods and they would get mistletoe and then they would sell it out on the corners, but they don't do that much anymore. It, It was also Oklahoma's state plant for a while. Right. Until this lady convinced them that it was a parasite and we didn't really want a parasitic plant to be our state plant. And then she lobbied for the Oklahoma rose, which is a terrible rose that everybody wants to grow because they live in Oklahoma. But, you know, at the time they thought it was a good rose anyway, but back to mistletoe, it's no longer our state plant. And I'm really glad because although it's pretty, it became the state plant because in 1907, when we became a state or not long after it's something that's green in the winter time. And so yes. people thought of it as an everlasting. Well, it's not so great, but your article does give it some positive qualities. Well, it's a friend to forests, pollinators, and woodland creatures, according to your article. Exactly. And so birds do eat the berries. The berries are poisonous to people, but not to birds. Right. And by the way, there is a, in England and Europe, there's a different species of plant that is the mistletoe than what we have here in the United States. Yes, we talked about that last year. Well, did we also talk last year about how mistletoe is so steeped with pagan religions, I guess? Yeah, I mean, it's steeped with lore, old, old, old lore, especially in England. And so that's why you'll never usually see it used as a decoration inside a church. Oh, well, that makes sense. I mean, although they took their holidays, they probably don't want their pagan symbols. Just yeah. Saying. Yeah. So anyway, so don't try to grow mistletoe from seed. And no. I always say, if you want mistletoe, just buy the fake stuff. Yeah. And the truth is, I just see it out in the, when I take my walks in the winter, I just sit up in the trees and I think it's nice and I go on with my life. Leave it be. Leave it be. They also, probably more than one person has fallen off a ladder trying to harvest mistletoe. Yeah. You don't need to harvest mistletoe if you really, I mean, I think it's kind of fallen out of fashion, don't you think? I think it somewhat has. And I think it was my dad once said that when they were kids, they would try to shoot it out of the tree with a you know, with a gun. Oh, yeah, yeah, with shotguns. I do. I actually remember that. I, people used to do that. I'm sure that that was really good looking mistletoe that fell. I, Plus, it's probably yeah. hard on the tree. <laughs> oh, these oh, crazy things that happen. We digress. Okay, that was okay, our dirt. So why except... did you put, you've got extra dirt because you have something I want. <laughs> I'm, I'm holding it up now. I have this Lennox Winter Meadow Mugs. Yes, I see. And it we in were a little hand. I think you should put this on YouTube so I can be jealous, even though I have my own Christmassy mug that also has pine cones on it and poinsettias. Did you see? I do see. But mine is prettier. I think mine's just as pretty, but that's yeah. fine. I love your mug. And they also have one with an amaryllis. So we went through this whole searching thing when we were planning this particular episode because I wanted her mug. But you know what? I don't want it enough to buy it. So I'm not doing it this year. All right. Plus, it's not really for sale anywhere. It's You have to buy it used somewhere. Well, I don't have a problem with buying used mugs. All right. So are you going to do the beautiful I did. little poem? Yeah, I did. We did this last year, but I thought, I'm going to repeat this. It's I heard good. a bird sing in the dark of December, a magical thing and sweet to remember. We are nearer to spring than we were in September. I heard a bird sing in the dark of December. Oliver Herford. And I, I love, actually have this. Love, love that. 
I have this cross stitch on a picture hanging in my den. I should take a picture and put it in the show notes. Yeah, you should. We'll put it in the newsletter. We have a lot of pictures in the newsletter this But it's appropriate because today is the 15th, Uh and so you and I decided to take the week of Christmas off, so the next episode after this one won't come out until January the 3rd. Which is my son's birthday and my mother's birthday. Yes. That's a good day to start back up. So today was the last day to use that quote. I'm glad you used it. So in our rabbit holes, shall I do my rabbit hole first? Yes, because then I can tie it back to that teaser. So my rabbit hole is that I was listening to the Two Alpha Gals podcast, and I've been on this rabbit hole, in this rabbit hole, looking into how to not get bit by a tick again. Because if you don't get bit by a tick again, Alpha Gal syndrome can wane over time, which is what I want. So they interviewed... In their latest episode, Mary Collins, who is the vice president of business development for some for a place called Insect Shield Clothing. And I learned a lot from this podcast. It wasn't just an ad for Insect Shield, although I will be investing in socks as soon as I get off this podcast because the socks are very important. So here's something I really learned that was interesting. The the permethrin is actually bonded to the fabrics fibers. And they say that it's good for 70 washings, 70, not five, not 10, as if you spray your own clothing, right? Seven. Right. And so that's the life of the garment because by, it isn't that it ever comes unbonded. It's just that it, the garment falls apart after 70 washings eventually. And so I learned that you should wear socks. You should wear good shoes, you should wear socks. You should tuck your pants into your socks. And the owner of the company suggests pants, socks, and then spray your shoes. Okay. And the reason is that ticks, really, they started this technology for mosquitoes because of people, you know, getting various diseases and they work with the military and they, they bond it to a bunch of the military and they see their whole, their clothing, not the military itself, the clothing. They see this as a real mission to help help people. And they said Mm -hmm. they didn't really become aware that ticks were a problem until Lyme disease started to rear its ugly head and then Rocky Mountain spotted fever. And then she said, right now it's exploding because of alpha gal syndrome. And what they, so they did testing first with mosquitoes, but lately they've done all of their testing with ticks and to be approved by the EPA, they have to do a extensive testing that it won't hurt human beings. And it's it's probably safer for you than some of the other options out there because it doesn't soak into your skin, supposedly. Okay. I'm not saying this. This is her. I don't know. I'm not a scientist. So the other part of this is that I thought was interesting is that the ticks get something called hot feet when they walk on the clothing. So they start at your Uh feet and they get hot feet. And she said they're small creatures the ones that bit me were very small. And she said, they don't like the feel of it on their feet. So they flip over and then they fall off. And so she said, we get 99% efficacy. So guess what I'll be getting socks. Cause I already have the pants and I actually have a shirt that I bought a while back. So but and I don't, so I don't know that I need the shirt. I just need the socks and the pants. You, you provided a link that would give 15% off. Through the alpha yeah. gals. Yeah, it's it's their link, and I think you get 15% off. So I think it's worth it. So when I was talking to you yesterday, this yeah. is the Christmas present I bought myself. I oh, bought myself one. I call them mowing socks. So I bought four pairs to wear outside mowing and in the garden and stuff. Even though, you know, I I have never been bitten by a tick in my garden at all. And so, mm-hmm. but you know, there's always a first time, and I thought. You should wear protective socks and things out there anyway, so. Yeah, you really should, so it doesn't nick you. I mean, the big thing for me is that I usually wear shorts in the garden. And so it's going to it's gonna be a big change for me, but I usually garden in the mornings mostly anyway. So I will just have to wear the leggings. I'm going to wear the leggings and the socks and spray my shoes. And I'm probably going to buy their spray. Although I looked at some spray yesterday at REI, but it only said it would last a little while. 
mean, like it was a really short time and I don't remember the brand. There are other brands. And she said, if you're wearing shoes that are rubber, obviously like rubber boots, obviously the spray won't matter. But she said, ticks can't really crawl on rubber very well anyway. But who wants to wear rubber shoes all the time in the garden unless it's raining? So true that. it's just a, a learning experience. And I, I've suggested it to everyone who lives anywhere east of I-35 in my state because they're that's where they're at now if you look at the map. So that's so, all. Anyway, I've and, and actually I ordered them yesterday. I signed uh-huh. up for the email and got 15% off. And I got an email this morning that they have uh, their ship, they're on their way. Dang, that was fast. They not only do the military, I mean, they they work with golfers. Mm-hmm. Right now, they've got a big golfer who's, I don't know anything about golfers, but he's promoting, you know, they're working it with him. And now they're working with the two alpha gals because I think this is all going to just boom more and more. Well, now it, it makes sense to work with golfers. And I will tell you why. Because my aunt and uncle live on a golf course in the summertime and they have their lawn. And then there's like a 20 foot strip of what's the rough, which is all mm-hmm. unmowed and cheap. He made a comment one time we were there for a family reunion. He says, if you walk out through there, you're going to get bit by a tick because the ticks all live in that un- that overgrowth. And so if you're a golfer mm-hmm. and you hit the ball into the that area and you don't want to take a stroke penalty because if you have to drop a ball, you have to take a stroke penalty. Right. You'll wade right into that. And you're likely to get bit by a tick. So for golfers that are out there, it probably is pretty dang important to protect yourself. Right. And they don't wear boots. I mean, they wear no. low shoes. And so the socks and the pants would definitely help them. And they have a lot of different pants. I just, it's just something I'm going to do. I mean, I'm not, you know, I don't, I don't, I think everybody should protect themselves from ticks, obviously. All How right. What was yours? So my rabbit hole is another lost lady of garden writing and I resurrected Mildred V. Ludi. I wrote about her last December and I wrote a new subsect article about her because she and her husband co-wrote the book, The Christmas Rose, in 1948. Oh, how nice. So I put a little biography of her, talked a little bit about the book, and then I added cultural information for the Helleborst Niger. So if you're a reader, historian, or a gardener, you'd find something in that substack. Yeah, that so sounds that, really That good. was my rabbit hole, went down in that rabbit hole. Amongst other rabbit holes, but that was the main one. All right. How about garden commissions? Well, it is nearly Christmas, so the garden does kind of take a back seat, but I will get my veggies ready for Christmas Day. I clearly need to tend my indoor plants a little bit better and watch over the last two African blue basil cuttings. So, And then I'll be watching Amaryllis bloom. How about you, Dee? I still need to plant those bulbs. They're going to be really Whoa, Bess, short. stop, bup, 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 stop yeah, a minute. I know. Don't, you have don't bulbs still to plant outside? I will not don't. shame. I will not shame. Our ground doesn't freeze, so we don't have your problem. And yours isn't freezing this year either. So <laughs> the only thing is they just have to get a good 8 to 12 weeks before they start to bloom cold. But they've been out in the garage. So they're cold anyway. So I think they'll be fine. It's not... It's not advantageous to plant them this late. And I was going to plant them this afternoon, but it is raining. So I will plant them tomorrow for sure. All right. So don't say for sure, but let us just say this. They're guaranteed not to bloom if you leave them in the garage. And we know you will eventually get them in the ground. We'll see. Did you, just, you just said we'll see at the end, which I don't blame you, but I have been rather busy. So I had to replace all of my toiletries, all of them. All yeah. of my makeup, all of my ha- hair stuff, everything. That's taken up a lot of my mental capacity this week. Yeah. How about we wrap this up? We shall wrap this up. We want to thank you for listening to The Garden Angelist. I hope you've hit that subscribe button so you don't miss a single episode. We publish every week on Wednesdays at 12 a.m. Eastern Time. If you listen to Apple Podcasts, we'd love a five-star review. That helps us get noticed by others. Could you also share our podcast with your friends? Word of mouth is still the best way to get the word out there. And be sure and check out our show notes for links for more information about today's topics, plus links to our own websites. And subscribe to our Substack newsletter, The Garden Angelist at Substack.com, also linked to in our show notes. If you do, you'll get a link to listen to the podcast a day early. 
And if you want to help support us, use those affiliate links. If you buy something after clicking through on them, we earn a small commission and it costs you nothing. Or you can set up a monthly subscription through Buzzsprout or make a one-time donation through PayPal. And we are grateful for those who have done so. It was lovely to chat with all of you over the garden gate. Bye until next week. Bye until next year. Happy New Year. Merry Christmas. (laughs) Bye, everybody.